Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show, your home for open, honest, and provocative conversations. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. The push for freedom is multiplying. You can feel it, can't you? The demands for a return to normalcy, for a return of the people's rights, like the right not to wear a mask, to say what gets injected into one's body without fear of losing one's job or education, to require truly informed consent on mandated medical treatments, to go to school without a mask, without plexiglass, without being treated like a leper when you're there. You could see it at the Defeat the Mandates rally in D.C. on Sunday. Thousands of protesters in the cold, standing up for a return to liberty. And I also want you to know, uh, spoiler alert, freedom wins. Mm. The papers tried to dismiss the event as, oh, just a bunch of MAGA folks with don't tread on me signs. But this was not a partisan event. Brett Weinstein, who helped organize it, is a liberal. Yesterday on this show, a self-described lifelong Democrat called in to say she had driven eight hours to be there. This isn't about left, right. Last weekend, I had dinner with 10 women in New York. These were women who voted for Joe Biden, some of whom campaigned for him. Women who considered themselves liberal and proud of it just one year ago, all of whom had effectively been red-pilled. Some just registered Republican. Most openly prayed that DeSantis will be our next president. A few even mentioned Trump in a positive light. And all are furious about ongoing draconian COVID policies at the local, state, and national level. These are responsible, loving, kind, professional women, moms, who hand sanitized, masked, quarantined, homeschooled, and didn't complain for nearly a year in a city devastated by COVID. But two weeks became two months, became two years, and nothing has changed. No off-ramps are provided, not just in New York City, but in many cities and states run by Democrats. And any complaints on behalf of themselves or their children are repeatedly met with, do your part, how dare you, or people are dying. Case in point, Barry Weiss, another liberal friend of ours, who has seen the light on COVID. On Bill Maher, uh, she appeared this past weekend, followed by a CNN doctor responding to her watch. You get the vaccine and you get back to normal. And we haven't gotten back to normal. And it's ridiculous at this point. This is going to be remembered by the younger generation as a catastrophic moral crime. Uh, the United States lost 10,000 people last week. Yeah. She needed to grow up because she's acting like a child. And when yeah. somebody who is, who is relatively young and relatively healthy says that, what they're saying is, I'll be okay if I get this virus. Screw you. He's mad because Barry said she's done. People are dying. He's not wrong about that. We all get that. The CDC says it was 7,000 people last week, not 10,000, mostly seniors. We have no idea how many of them actually died from COVID as opposed to just dying with COVID, a distinction the fear mongers keeping these tallies refuse to make. But yes, people are still dying from COVID, which is not going anywhere. And so we are faced with a decision now, after two years of this, of how we are going to handle this reality and also foster the well-being of our children and ourselves. The COVID death rate matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. And guess who realized that first? Moms, like my new pals, and they are not selfish to say they, like Barry, are done. Their kids missed nearly a year of in-person school, when after 12 months of remote learning, they attended and opened the school's rally, they were called white supremacists. Their kids still played basketball, dripping with sweat into a mask, and while mandatorily vaccinated. The children, as young as two, have been forced to wear masks for eight to ten hours a day for nearly two years. The kids' ears are sore, their faces are broken out, they can't breathe as well, they can't understand one another, they don't know what anyone's smile looks like. They've been forced to eat lunch outside on the ground while six feet apart, sometimes in frigid temperatures. Many children are not even allowed to speak 
during lunch, including last year, my own. They see each other, other children at lunch, only through plexiglass. They're no longer allowed to sing at school. They're harshly scolded or even threatened with expulsion if their mask dips down below their nostrils. Hi, Horace Mann, talking about you. These kids lose playdates because other kids' moms are too scared to allow socializing. Their extracurricular activities have been canceled, along with their prom, their homecoming dance, their bar mitzvah. Is it any wonder the CDC says attempted suicides by teenage girls in the pandemic have gone up 51 percent? That stress, anxiety and depression among children has doubled since this thing started? These moms live in a city in which neither they nor their children can go into a restaurant, a Knicks game, a theater or a gym without a vaccine and a mask and now a booster and their papers. A city in which CRT is rampant in the schools, violent crime, including murder, has spiked to record levels. Mentally ill vagrants are cutting up men in ATM vestibules and throwing innocent women in front of oncoming subway trains. They are dealing with a lot. They are doing their best to not scare their children, to give them normal lives, to play down their fears, not stoke them. Why doesn't the harm to these children? being done during this pandemic count? Why do so many others belittle it or dismiss demands for normalcy as selfish? People like those who host The View, for example, who undermine these New York moms and others just like them. Yesterday, they took aim at Bill Maher, another liberal who has also had it with the COVID hysteria. I don't want to live in your paranoid world anymore, your masked paranoid world. You know, you go out, it's silly now. You know, you have your mask, you have to have a card, you have to have a booster, they scan your head. Like you're a cashier and I'm a bunch of bananas. I'm not bananas, you are. That messaging? Not okay for the ladies of The View who love to mask, vax, and above all, shame. That's not really funny to people who have lost their kids mm, to no. this vaccine or people who have lost family members. Or- this is not something we're doing because it's you know sexually gratifying. This is what we're doing to protect our families. And you don't have to do it, but stay away from everybody. Because- then stay out of the public, man. This is not, nobody wants this. I don't want it. And I think he's forgetting that people are still at risk who cannot get vaccinated. People who can't get that. Little kids under the age of five. Yeah. Or people with health conditions. How dare you be so flippant, man? They're they still like, people. They gotta, they're over it. Like, yeah. like a relationship. I'm yeah. over it. I don't feel like I don't seeing him we're... anymore. Once again, people are still at risk. Don't you care about the people who died? What about the children? How dare you? How dare you, Whoopi? For two years, the American people have sacrificed incredibly during this pandemic. They have proven over and over and over again they're not a spoiled, selfish bunch of brats. They lost jobs, businesses, careers, marriages, life savings, while at the same time, in many cases, losing parents, friends, colleagues, and teachers. They get it. They watched their children's anxiety, stress, depression, and even suicidal ideations go through the roof, all in the name of doing their part. They wore masks when they didn't want to. They got vaxxed and boosted when they didn't necessarily need to. They missed graduations, weddings, births, even funerals. They did all of this because they do care. And they were willing to make sacrifices for the good of society. But that calculation involves a balancing test. And at some point, the safety provided to society by these measures will no longer outweigh the negative impact on one's self, one's family and one's community. And we're there. That's what Barry and Bill and these moms and I are saying. We have vaccines. We have therapeutics. We have PCR tests. We have antigen tests. We know far more about this virus than we used to, like the fact that we can all get and spread it, vaccinated 
and masked or not. And it is time to try to get back to normal. Like those red pilled liberal moms that I met. I have young kids and I also have an 80 year old mother and I get the need to protect the young and the old. My mom, she takes precautions and we help her. But she would never want our children to stay in COVID purgatory until all risk had been abated. Why are we treating our seniors, most of whom lived through far more challenging times than we have without caving to their fears, as if they are incapable of handling risk? They're strong. They know how to protect themselves. And most of them have no interest in burdening their children and grandchildren, even if it would eliminate some risk to themselves. As for children under five who cannot yet be vaxxed, whoopee. What a red herring, and you know it. The COVID death rate of healthy children under 11 is approximately zero. What these kids need is not more restrictions, it's less. They need to go to school, to see their friends' faces, to play, to sing, to play sports, and get their heart rates up and have their faces uncovered while doing so, to eat lunch indoors, and to laugh and talk, not through plexiglass to have their proms, their graduations, to not be treated like they are dirty, disease-carrying killers. One final note. Some, like Whoopi's colleague Sarah Haynes, take a different view. They maintain this is the new normal. Listen. To the post-mask part, because I think there's a prudence we've learned with the mask, kind of like 9-11 with flying, is always going to be here now. There's a new normal. I think some of the things we've learned in this pandemic are going to stay the same. I may never ride a subway again without a mask. I may never go indoors to big crowds and never feel comfortable without a mask. And that's up to me to do that. If Sarah would like to do that, fine. But I choose something different. I do not accept her new normal. The moms I met do not accept her new normal. Most Americans don't. We have never voted for these restrictions. They were handed down by leaders declaring emergencies that have now lasted years. It's not okay. It has to end. And if you agree, you have to fight. Now is the time. It's past time. Fight. Write your governor, your congressmen and women. A letter to the editor. Attend a rally. Call your principal. You don't normally do that? Too bad. It's time. And vote. Vote like my new friends in New York are going to do. Vote in November like your future and that of your children depends on it. And don't let anyone shame you for demanding your rights, for protecting your children after two years of enormous sacrifice. We did our part. This isn't selfish. Liberty is a right. And none of this ends until we insist on its return. Joining me now is a mom who is doing just that, insisting on the return to normal. Megan Rafalski lives in Loudoun County, Virginia. She's the head of education task force to take back our schools. And Loudoun County, as you know, has become ground zero in this fight. Yesterday, after Governor Glenn Youngkin said it was up to parents to decide if their child would be masked at school, she sent her 10-year-old boy to school without one. The school responded by sending him home. Megan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, Megan. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. And I know you're feeling the same frustrations I am. And had a moment of celebration when Glenn Youngkin won and said, I'm going to sign an executive order and then did so. And you had that feeling that I continue to wait to have where they can just go with their beautiful faces exposed and see their friends' beautiful faces and have a normal day at school without all the issues that come attached to these protocols. And you sent your boy and what happened? Yeah, um, there's so much to say. Um, You're exactly right. I mean, when he when Governor Youngkin came out with the executive order on last week, I cried and um my husband and my son both embraced me and my, my son was so excited. Um, we've been battling this since the beginning of the year for first, we asked for a religious exemption that was denied. Then we asked for a medical exemption, um, of which we really didn't feel like we, uh, legally needed to, um, but we were trying to go about the proper 
channels. Uh, that was also denied. Um, my son's been having dizziness headaches. He nearly blacked out in class one day. Um, he began to have nosebleeds right before Christmas break. Um, and his overall demeanor has been with school just, I mean, I, I hesitate to say it, but depressed. It's been a really, really rough year. And it's such a travesty because we love our school. We have been there since kindergarten. We actually, we have a special exemption right now to go there that they have now threatened to revoke because we want him to finish with his peers to laugh and play exactly like you were talking about. So when we showed up yesterday morning, along with another group of, um, uh, moms, dads, and kids to walk in. We were strong armed at the door and told immediately to go to the library. We had asked several questions to which no one gave us answers. Long story short, our principal said he would be with us after announcements, then made us wait outside in the freezing cold for an, over an hour with our kids waiting to go to their classrooms. We asked why they were not being allowed to go to their classroom. I handed yet another letter of my religious exemption that I didn't really need because the governor uh, said that we had our parental rights restored as they should be. Um, and he took it and, and pretty much didn't respond to it at all and just continued to quote what he says is policy. It's not policy. It's a mandate by the superintendent um, that's unlawful, by the way. And uh, I would just encourage any teacher. I know you're out there. We see you. We hear you. There are ones that I'm talking to. If you are feeling threatened by administration, you need to go to HR. You need to tell them that you are working in a hostile work environment and that they are forcing you to do things that are unlawful. I know, unfortunately, right now that you are stuck in between a rock and a hard place in a lot of ways, and you can't talk to some of your colleagues because they have drunk the Kool-Aid, they're, they're experiencing hypoxemia because they've got 18 masks on and they're upset, as they should be. They can't breathe. But you've got to start making your voice heard, or this is not going, going to change. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. My son was in, he was forced to go in the principal's office to which he closed the door with my son in there alone, highly inappropriate. I already have, um, you know, I, I'm not going to get into that. That's getting into some things that are too personal at this point. Um, but the point of the matter is we are having a rally tonight of a rally for our rights at the school board meeting in Loudoun County. And I encourage anyone who's listening right now, if you are in the area and you want to fight for the, the rights of our, uh, the parents to, to be the ones who decide what is right for their child. And you're right, Megan. I mean, you had so many good things to say in your monologue, like personal choice, right? The party that cries, my body, my choice, my choice, my choice, where is choice now? And I understand, and I am not being flippant at all about the severity for some people, but all the actual science and statistic statistics out there show us that cloth masks, which is what these children are wearing, do not do squat. It's like trying to catch mosquitoes with a chain link fence. It doesn't work. That shows that all of the um, statistics we're seeing now with tests on these kids for after two years, kids born in the last two years have a lower IQ already. All of this stuff is happening and it's a, been a political war in a lot of ways. Listen, I'm a mom. I love to be at my house. I like to clean it. I like to cook and provide and have people in it. I like to take my son to his baseball practices and I like to do lead a, a quiet life, but I have been forced to take the reins in a lot of ways because we've got to stand up. And if we don't stand up, then it's not going to change. So Megan, yes. you're right. Plead with people, get involved, get involved. You have yes. to. It's past time. When I, I was speaking with these moms, I felt so inspired by them because none of them was particularly active. You know, I mean, a couple of them yes. really wanted Joe Biden elected and had worked to get him elected. But, you know, they weren't the ones calling up the school board or going to the meetings or calling the principal or writing letters. And so on. they weren't. But that what our kids have been through over the past two years is bad enough. And there are no off ramps provided that have raised our level of concern exactly right. high enough that we realize now no one's fighting for them. No one's no. fighting for them. And I am sick and tired of people like Whoopi Goldberg trying to shame people who stand up to say something, to say that balancing test is now leaning the other way. That doesn't mean we don't give a damn about the people dying from COVID, but it's still a balancing test. And we have other yes. little people whose fortunes literally depend on us. You know, we Absolutely. they have no one advocating for them. They're 
There's no one. Glenn Youngkin tried and your school board is overruling him. You're right. And can I just say that no one's talking to these kids. That's the whole point. They're talking to one another. They're getting guidance from people that know what they're talking about on all this science, science, follow the science. Okay. Yeah. Let's actually follow the science. Now, since we've been saying it 14 days to slow the spread has long since come and gone again, the severity of COVID for some people is a very real thing. Absolutely. My in-laws over the Christmas break, they were severely ill. I would even say on death's door when I arrived to take care of them from COVID praise God for people and doctors that are willing to step up and prescribe things that are necessary to fight an illness, things that actually don't cost a lot of money, things that don't have the name Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson and Johnson on them. You need to find a doctor. I would say before you get sick so that you have a plan of attack when you do get sick. But let me just tell you this upping your zinc, your vitamin C, your vitamin D, and getting outside for some fresh air is going to give you a really good chance when you, when, and if you do sick, get sick, which you most likely will. This is like the flu. Now we are, we're nearing that endemic. Like it's going to be around. You've got to figure out how to live with this. And this is not a long-term solution that is sustainable. And they are destroying our kids' lives, absolutely yeah. destroying them. Yep. And if, if we don't fight, no one will. That's what we've seen. Right. You know, you kind of sit back sometimes and let other people take the lead. You don't want to be the squeaky wheel. You're like, somebody else is going to solve this, going to come to an end. It, it hasn't. They won't. They, they, don't, they don't want to. And certainly people right. without kids. Um, I don't know whether Wh- Whippy Goldberg has children of her own or whether she has young children. I don't think she does because she's, a, she's an, elder, an older person now. Um, but it, like... They don't care. They, they really don't give a shit. They look at our kids like you should take the hit. So, OK, it's time for pushing back. The kids did it take is. the hit and they were they were champions. They were amazing about it. But it's done. It's that piece of this has got to stop because now we're actually ruining the experience of a generation. And I don't I don't want to hear from one more. My, my, my kid doesn't mind wearing the mask. Great good for your kid, then you put your kid in that mask. My kid minds. If it's relevant what they mind or what they don't mind, then let's talk about that. Let's make it individual. And yet they still pretend like we are in March of 2020 and it's infuriating. Mm It is infuriating. It's totally infuriating. And you're right, Megan. I was not an activist, you know, and I, I, I love gardening. I love being outdoors. I like, you know, having coffee with friends and listening to what they're going through and comforting them and encouraging them and praying with them. Two years ago, when we were in school, my son was in third grade at the time. I was hearing about the, these pornography books and what in the world are they talking about? These books start coming into our school. That's a whole nother story for another day that I'd love to talk about. Um, and actually, I'm I, I'm so excited about your next guest, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it is. Or yeah, not, yeah. But I have her it. book, Abigail Schreier. I have her in a minute. Yes, right here, Abigail Schreier. She is on to it. Yes. So there's so much damage. It's amazing. I know yes, they're damaging them in so many ways. It's like I didn't even scratch the surface. I want to say oh, this. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a legal battle now in Virginia. Um, there's going to be a lawsuit. There's there's already a lawsuit by the schools challenging the, the Youngkin executive order, claiming that it violates uh, a state law that was enacted under the earlier governor uh, that says you have to follow the CDC recommendations. And that's why they can't lift the mask mandate. That's going to there's going to be a legal challenge and they're, they're going to present it to a judge and a judge is going to have to read the letter of the law and decide whether that's true. But even so. The Virginia state legislature is prepared, as I understand it, to write a new law. So th- what are they waiting for? Just do it. Just do it. Don't wait. Just do it. Get on it. And apparently they have the votes and now they have a Republican governor. Uh, these kids, these kids have suffered long enough. Megan, I'm so glad that you're fighting, that your your son is fighting and let him Absolutely. know that I know he knows this, but he's not alone. I know there were about 160 to 100 students not let in yesterday. Um, he's yeah. not alone. Can I say no something about kids. that real quick? Yeah, I'll give you the last word. So. In an effort to control the narrative, as usual, there were so many children that showed up to go into school unmasked and were strong armed by the presence of authority and standing there looking at them and intimidating them. Pull up your mask, pull up your mask, 
put on your mask, where's your mask and people, kids. So especially in the high school, and I want to talk about this because this is something that is not being discussed enough. There are teachers that are threatening kids to sideline them from sports, to not write recommendation letters because they either haven't gotten the vax or they don't wear a mask to school. Let's talk about that. That needs to be talked about a little bit more. The, the mind control of the adults in the room is absolutely despicable and deplorable and something needs to be done with about it. And Loudoun County seems to be uh, claiming such an equitable environment. Well, I have seen quite a lack of that recently. Well, I can't wait to see what happens at the school board meeting tonight. We'll cover it tomorrow. Me too. Megan, good luck. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And when we come back, it was a good tease by Megan. Abigail Schreier is here and we are talking. Uh, you're not going to believe this. A mom believes the school has been pushing her daughter to become trans, her seventh grader. And now she's got the actual audio tapes and Abigail's going to play them here for the first time to prove it. Wait until you hear these California teachers and their plan for this one woman's child. Don't go away. What if you could lower your mortgage rate without adding years to your loan, potentially saving hundreds of dollars a month and tens of thousands long-term. Well, fortunately for you, it is possible when you call American Financing, America's home for home loans. You're gonna start with a free mortgage review from one of their salary-based mortgage ex experts, not one of those annoying commission-based people who's like, take it, take it, take it, take it. <laughs> so you can understand all of your home loan options. From flexible terms to competitive rates, they've got you covered. You can really save up to $1,000 a month with these guys, and you can choose any term 10 years and over. So you're not wasting money on years that you do not need. Custom loans do not get any better than this, especially since it only takes a 10 minute call to learn more and you don't have to pay any upfront or hidden fees. So what are you waiting for? If you get started soon, you may be able to close in as fast as 10 days. I'm sure you could use the cash. 866-887-1201. 866-887-1201. Eight eight seven twelve zero one. Got it. Eight six six eight eight seven twelve zero one, or just go to AmericanFinancing.net. Welcome back to the Megan Kelly Show. I'm joined now by Abigail Schreier, the brilliant Abigail Schreier. And if you have not read, if you haven't read her book Irreversible Damage, the transgender craze seducing our daughters. You have to. You must. It, it's a life changer. I mean, truly, it's a life changing experience. She is now an independent journalist on Substack as well. Abigail, that's wonderful. That's amazing. And it's so great to have you back. Oh, it's great to be here, Megan. Always great oh, to talk to you. Likewise. So, OK. And you heard our last guest is in love with you, too. Um, this story is scary. This we talked about this when you came on my show and to the listening audience, if you didn't hear Abigail's full length interview on our show um, from last year, it's one of my very favorite interviews we did since I launched the show. And um, we talked about what's happening in certain school districts, including California. And I think you told me about how in California, some schools or the public schools that they allow students to leave campus during the daytime and go off campus to get cross gender hormones um, or puberty blockers. I know it's happening and they don't loop in the parents. But this is next level what you've discovered out of this one California school. So can you just set up the story for us? Sure. So I was sent audio um, of a California Teachers Association that's the largest uh, public school teachers association, uh, public school union in California, um, in which two teachers were, give, were at a large conference and um, someone had recorded it. And these two teachers were talking about how to deceive parents and um, uh, electronically surveil students for personalized invitations to the LGBTQ clubs, how to hide the uh, membership of these clubs for, from parents. And we're talking about middle schoolers, 12 year olds. Um, and, and they were, you know, specifically targeting, you know, students they thought would be vulnerable to invitations with personalized inv uh, invitations to join the cl club. So, um, you know, this was all on audio. I wrote it up and it's, it's highly disturbing. It's outrageous. It's immoral. Uh, and, and maybe illegal. It's unbelievable. This one mom believed that they had tried to push her daughter into thinking she was a boy. And she's suspected based on her daughter's experience and then you get it on tape these teachers admitting 
They do exactly that. So here is, there, it's two teachers in particular who you have on tape. Uh, I believe this teacher is named Kelly Bakari, and it's Soundbite 8 talking about how they totally stalked the children. Listen. So we started to brainstorm at the end of the 2020 school year. What are we going to do? We got to see some kids in person at the end of the last year, not many, but a few. So we started to try and identify kids. We totally, when we were doing our virtual learning, totally stocked what they were doing on Google, right, when they weren't doing schoolwork. One of them was the kid Googling trans day of disability. And you're like, check, we're going to invite that kid when we get back onto campus. Um, whenever they follow, like, the Google Doodle links or whatever, right, we make note of those kids and the things that they bring up with each other in chats or email or whatever. Um, and we use our observations of kids in the classroom, conversations that we hear, to personally invite students, because that's really the way that we kind of get the, the bodies in the door, right? That they need sort of a little bit of an invitation. Okay, so so that's at a teacher's you I didn't realize it was at a teacher's union meeting because I what I saw was that there was some meeting discussing quote best practices. This is her pitch for the best practices for teachers. That's the important thing to know. These are not two rogue teachers. In fact, I uncovered more um, videos from the California Teachers Association in which they are training teachers uh, statewide in the deception of parents and the, through these um, LGBTQ clubs, commonly called the Gay Straight Alliance Clubs, or um, they have various names for them. This one was called an equity club and then UBU. Uh, but, but they're even doing it in the elementary level. And the point, and they will often direct kids not to tell the parents. The really insidious thing here is that they're hiding it. They're actively deceiving the parents. They're telling kids to keep secrets from their parents. UBU, Y-O-U. B Y O U, and the reason she chose that as the name of her club for LGBTQ kids is because she didn't want it to be too on the nose, to where the parents could uh, could know just by the name of the club that this was something involving you know potential trans issues and so on, because they they want to foster secrecy between the children and their parents, and they're succeeding in really gender confusing. A lot of young kids. I mean, you know, you heard from Jessica Conan, the mother who was who is furious and suing, and rightly so. Um, but you know, going out and changing a young kid's gender identity um, without discussing this with the parents, giving them a new name and pronouns, and that's what was done. You know, she alleged uh, she alleges um, to her twelve-year-old daughter. I mean, this is something that the courts are going to have to sort, sort out, and parents are critical. Here here, they absolutely must fight back. Mm. This is that mom that you just mentioned. Now, again, uh, her name, Jessica Conan. She was at a school board meeting in December. Just to just so I'm perfectly clear, I, I may have misstated this. Is Kelly Bakari and the other woman who she's talking with on this on these tapes, is she at Jessica Conan's school? Or is this these yeah, are Kelly Baraki different? and Lori Cadera uh, Caldera are at the Spreckle School. They've been suspended. Um, but you know, look, this is how the California Teachers Association is training teachers statewide. This is not about two t rogue teachers. And that's what I really want everyone to know. Whatever happens with these two teachers, we've got a massive problem. This was an agricultural community. Okay. This is not a liberal community. The activist teachers know exactly what they're doing and they're not confined to the Upper West Side or Sa Santa Monica. And they, they just before we play Jessica's soundbite of her going off on the school board about what they did to her 12 year old girl, um, they because the, the, the soundbite was a little hard to decipher. But we have it verbated if you guys want to look at it on YouTube later. Um, they're talking about how she was going during the remote learning, the teachers on the Google Docs um, record, you know, that the teacher can see what the student's done and the student uses it at home to see where they've Googled, what whether they Googled something, anything having to do with trans or LGBTQ. And that's how they would say, aha, th that's a mark. We got to go get her. And they would recruit them. And meanwhile, you and I talked about this last time. You explained that in, you know, something upwards of 85 percent of the Kid, the cases where kids think they may be trans, if you just leave them alone and don't do anything, it goes away. It resolves. You don't, you don't want them recruited by teachers into a group that celebrates it. No, we're, we're solidifying a, tr you know, a very gender confused identity 
identity in a generation of kids. I mean, really uh, in astounding numbers of kids now. And yes, historically, gender dysphoria, which is an absolutely real condition that afflicted an infinite, you know, truly infinitesimal um, uh, percentage of the population, a very, very small, you know, 0.001% of the population. Um, you know, over 70% of the kids always outgrew it on their own. Um, some didn't and in, in adulthood would transition. But today, we're not giving them time to outgrow it. We're affirming and, and solidifying that identity in young people and putting them on a path to being lifetime medical patients. Mm -hmm. And there's so much regret in so many of these kids when they take drastic measures, like Abigail's book says, they cause irreversible damage to their bodies because they get sucked into like groups online or perhaps at school that want to celebrate the transition before they're even sure whether they want to make one. And then there's tons of pressure to go through with it. Tons of pressure to go through with it and not to reverse. Okay, so here is this mom, Jessica Conan, who's now suing this school for what they did to her 12-year-old daughter. Listen. Do they have psychiatry degrees that I was unaware of? Because I didn't hire them. Okay, I did not hire them to sit there and nitpick my child's brain. You took away my ability to parent my child. Even before I had any knowledge. I didn't even get to show support. You asked for support, I didn't get a chance. Your job was to educate my child in math, science, English, etc. Do your job and let me do mine. Okay. You changed her personal documentation, her gender, her name, her email. I authorized an AKA added to her attendance because I wanted to be supportive. But guess what? She's allergic to bees. Her medical record says a birth name and you changed it. Who administers that now? Not everything, not me. You guys did this on your own accountability and you've gone too far. They downgraded me in front of my child and allowed me to question myself as a mother. You sat there and told me how my child was going to be. And then you wrapped your hands around her while I sat across the table and cried. Because you thought you could be there better than I, and I never got a chance. She was scared to even say anything. Your guys' voice were heard, not hers. Wow. What do you make of that? I mean, it's hard to listen to. Um, it, it, the, you, the pain is so raw. And I've talked to a lot of these parents. Look, t schools are doing this. They are conspiring. It's a conspiracy because it's a school-wide conspiracy. They change, they create these um, documents called gender support plans. They change the child's, uh, you know, name, gender pronouns, um, identity in school, and they actively conceal this from parents. I've talked to parents who have walked through the halls, who have been on the PTA, and had teachers lie to their faces by calling the, the, the daughter by the female name in front of the parent while secretly calling her a different name with the school. This is so confusing to a 12 year old when she has been identifying as a boy for a year it's awfully hard to go back but it's also alienating her from her parents because she's creating this whole secret world from them so the parents the people best able to protect her are completely unable to do so you know we have parental rights under the 14th amendment the due process clause allows us, you know, to direct the upbringing of our children. And we need to fight this. Parents need to go into court and have the courts uh, sort this out because the public schools are not going to give them back their rights. You know what else? It's such a dangerous precedent. If you're a predator at a school where this is the atmosphere, oh, we do secrets between teachers and students. It's not appropriate to tell mom and dad everything. Mom and dad are the ones who are the bad ones, the outsiders, the ones who don't want what makes you happy. I'm here for you. This is how sexual abuse takes place in schools and stays under the rug for too long because teachers groom young children and lead them to believe that telling is the mistake and that the parents are the outsiders. I'm not saying that these teachers are sexual abusers. I'm saying this approach to the relationship between teacher, student and parent is sick. That's exactly right. That was so well said. You know, the nefarious thing is the secrecy. And what they are doing is just as you said, they are breaking down boundaries between, you know, uh, uh, children and, uh, and adults. And by creating a secret space from the parents, a secret world. And yes, that absolutely conditions a child to be, you know, approached by a predator. Because after mm -hmm. all, the child's already be, been habituated to this idea that there's, that you keep these secrets from your parents with adults, with other mm -hmm. adults. The, um, this woman did find Jessica, 
Harmeet Dillon. Yay. Thank goodness she did. She is suing. Harmeet's amazing. She's been taking on a lot of these cases and she gave a statement. Um, I think this is to the Daily Mail saying that since she filed the case, she has heard from parents across multiple states who describe, quote, secretive trans grooming by school officials, similar to what Jessica Conan is alleging. The school board um is, this is amazing. So neither the, of the teachers could be reached for comment when the Associated Press reached out. One of them, Caldera, had said to the San Francisco Chronicle, the quotes are accurate, but they were taken out of context or misrepresented. The stalking comment was a joke, she said. Um, she the, the teachers have been placed on administrative leave, as you said, and the district has hired a law firm to investigate. And, and the superintendent says that... Um, the personnel policies prevent him from revealing whether the teachers are back at school, but the district is reviewing and updating its policies on student clubs. That's not going to be sufficient. Nowhere near sufficient. I mean, it's amazing. She says the quotes were accurate, but taken out of context. Well, that's why I quoted them at length, because I had a feeling once they were aired, someone might say, oh, we need more context. We need more context for the surveilling of kids to find out who's vulnerable to a private invitation, personalized in-person invitation to an LGBTQ club where you can't tell your parents. I mean, look, these clubs are fine. They can exist, but there absolutely needs to be full transparency with parents. And what keeps parents from fighting back is they're embarrassed. They're afraid of upsetting their child. Look at Jessica Conan. Her daughter's doing much better. Okay, and her daughter knows that her mother's fighting for her. Parents need to get over their embarrassment and get out there and sue. Because this Lori Caldera Caldera is on tape saying, because we're not official, we have no club rosters. We keep no records. In fact, sometimes we don't really want to keep records because if parents get upset that their kids are coming, we're like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they came. And your point is. This is all intentional. She did actively work to keep parents from knowing what club their child was in and whether they had an issue like this, which can be severely traumatizing emotionally and otherwise. And she ought to be fired. She should be fired immediately, as should this Kelly. uh, However you say her last name. There's so much more to discuss. Um, We're going to pick it up there and we're going to talk about this transgender swimmer at UPenn because now there's an allegation uh, that Leah Thomas, who formerly swam on the men's team, she's biologically male, um, conspired to lose a race to a different trans swimmer. It's getting complicated. It's next. Uh, And remember, you can find The Megyn Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east. The full full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Megyn Kelly. If you prefer an audio podcast, subscribe and download on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast for free. And there you will find our full archives, including more than 240 shows. And you have to listen to our first time with Abigail Schreier way back. This is how much I love her on episode 12. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-owned coffee company serving premium coffee to people who love America. They develop their explosive roast profiles with the same mission focus they learned as military members, serving this great country of ours, and they are committed to supporting veterans, law enforcement, and first responders. With every purchase you make, they will give back. Black Rifle Coffee imports high-quality coffee beans from Colombia and Brazil, and they roast them five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee, and Salt Lake City, Utah. The best way to enjoy their freedom-filled coffee is through the Black Rifle Coffee Club. When you join the club, your chosen brew is roasted, packaged, and shipped free to your door on your schedule, and you're going to love their coffee mugs. They're delicious. Not only do you save a trip to the store, but you also receive special discounted pricing on roasts and gain access to exclusive products, members-only content, partner discounts, and more, like the mugs. They are delicious, what's inside of them. And they're beautiful, and they're cool. They're kind of cool. They choose good colors. And they're like the right size. Sorry. Uh, With temperatures cooling off, don't let it stop you from getting outside and into the great outdoors. With signature roasts like Lava Panther, Medium Roast, which Black Rifle directly source, farm to cup from a small farm in Guatemala, uh, it just makes the whole experience better. Black Rifle Coffee delivers fresh roasted coffee from around the world to your doorstep. Try it out. BlackRifleCoffee.com. And use the code MK at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. 
So, Abigail, one other thing before we leave this uh, first story. Buena Vista Middle School is the name of the school, I should mention, uh, in Southern California. Lori Caldera and Kelly Baraki are the teachers we're discussing, though it's not limited to them uh, in this school or others, maybe even yours, to the parents out there listening. But this Caldera was awarded um, some award as a role model for inclusion. And she came out defending her work, saying the students set the agenda that the teachers are there to provide honest and fair answers to their questions. And this is as this mother is claiming that this, that Lori Kelly and others planted the seed in her daughter's head that she was bisexual, then went on to convince her that she was actually a transgender boy. This, this happened in my school, not this exact thing, but my, this is the reason I left my boys school. I took my boys out, Doug and I did because they, they taught the boys. I think I told you this on the, in the show. One of the parents at the parent teacher said, why did my son come home asking, is it true he can prevent puberty by taking a pill and then have his penis cut off at age 18 if he wants to be a girl? And the teacher's defense, we expected her to say, no, we never said that. Her response was, we take the discussion wherever the boys want it to go. We were all like, why do you do that? That's not okay with us. That's right. This is all over the country. I mean, this is not confined to Southern California at all. In fact, this was an agricultural community, um, you know, where this took place near, near Salinas. Um, this is not, you know, Santa Monica, um, but it is all over the country. I get calls from parents in Florida, um, you know, you name it. And um, it's incredibly flagrant. They believe they have the right to do this. And I'll tell you something. You said, oh, this is student led. Well, I can tell you why I know that's not true, because I examined many of the videos put out by the California Teachers Association. That's the largest public school teachers union in California. And one of the things that is a common theme in the creation of a middle school LGBTQ club and the and even elementary school LGBTQ club is they have trouble with retention. Kids don't want to show up, especially when the weather's nice outside. So the teachers will in talk uh, and instruct other educators statewide on how do we get the kids to stay? How do we get the kids to come back? And one of the things they talk about is giving out candy. One uh, teacher brought oh up Jolly Lord. Ranchers was very effective. Me? I mean, this is ridiculous. It is very much activist teacher driven. This is not based on the, the student wants. It's really based on the, the teachers and uh, gratifying their activist uh, agenda. Does. Giving out candy? I'm picturing that creepy guy and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with the creepy little candy thing. You know, remember? Like, that's insane. I love the fact that the students don't really want anything to do with them. You know, I love the fact that they have actually to take these active measures to recruit. So if we can just get them to stop doing that, maybe these kids can lead a normal life and not be bothered and outgrow the normal phases that are being misidentified as a kid being trans. Yeah, and I'll just say that this is not a gay or transgender issue really at all. In fact, most of the teachers who are pushing this agenda are neither gay nor transgender. Um, you know, and, and unsurprisingly, uh, you know, middle schoolers don't always want to sit around with a middle-aged white woman talking about gender um, and, and their new gender identity or their new uh, sexuality. Um, they'd, they'd rather go play ball. Um, but, you know, I, I have transgender parents calling me and, and gay parents calling me all the time saying, we don't really want these people we don't know keeping secrets with our kids and creating new identities for our kids. I mean, I literally had a transgender parent call me and say, I really don't like this. What can I do to stop it in my kid's school? Nor are transgender parents from coast to coast looking f to recruit other transgender people. But transgender people are not looking to recruit other trans people. Only these weird activists are doing this crap, right? They don't speak for the trans community. They don't, this is wrong on every level, whether it's gay, lesbian, you know, like you, like I have trans people who are friends, le gay and lesbian people who are in your family and so on. Like, they don't want to recruit. This is a weird new dynamic of like dangling something in front of the children and trying to make it seem cool or desirable. And and you've got them in these transcripts talking about how they say like, well, how do we get them? Well, we go back to them. We say, we miss you. We miss you. And it's just totally, it, it's so un, you know, truthful to suggest that this is somehow bigoted approach by parents. I mean, think about it this way. What if a teacher were just creating a secret Christian club in which they were going to teach kids uh, about Christianity, but not tell the parents? 
So they told the kids, don't tell the parents, but we're here to talk about faith and my interpretation of your faith. I wonder how parents would react then. And and we know how parents would react. They would hate that. They would say, that's mm-hmm. none of your business. And what are you doing in my family's faith? And uh, my kids aren't supposed to keep secrets from me. And that's what we should be saying across the board with everything, including LGBTQ clubs. Well, and especially if, what if you're Jewish? <laughs> then you really object. It's like, wait a minute, stay in your lane. <laughs> we did a lot to educate our child on, on what his religion is and what our beliefs are. And y- you're not going to change it in your secret club, which is kind of what they're doing. Um, all right, we're going to pick it up with Leah Thomas. I'm going to hold you over if you don't mind. We'll talk about Leah Thomas. Not at all. That, that case is getting confusing and even more disturbing. And now there's an allegation that she lost. So she, this is a biological male swimming as a woman. She's been crushing all the women on her team and other teams. Then she swam against a biological woman who was about to transition to male. That's why they they were allowed to uh, swim against each other. And she lost. Now there's an allegation. It was a deal between the two of them. Don't go away. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Biotrust's Ageless Multi-Collagen Supplements. Have you been hearing all about collagen supplements lately? Who doesn't want to look younger and feel better? Collagen is the key. By the time we hit middle age, our bodies produce less than half the collagen they did in their 20s. Since collagen makes up our skin, hair, joints, nails, bones, the gradual loss of it over time is why people look old. Our modern diets are not helping either. As we age, it would take all day to cook and eat the right foods to properly nourish our bodies with enough collagen. BioTrust's Ageless Multi-Collagen Proteins provide you with the five types of collagen needed to support the entire anti-aging process, plus essential amino acids to make it a complete protein. Many other brands on the market only use one or two types of collagen. There's no clumping, and it can be mixed into a hot or cold beverage or soups. No artificial colors or flavors or preservatives or sweeteners, gluten-free, non-GMO, free of hormones and antibiotics. Try it for yourself. Here's what I would like you to do. Go to biotrust.com slash MK to get your special offer of up to 51% off today. 51%. You will also get free shipping on your order and support from personal health and fitness coaches to work and share their expertise with you. That's biotrust.com slash MK to get your special offer of up to 51% off. So Abigail, this UPenn situation continues to make news. They have um, a person who was born male, who lived his life as a man, who was on the male swimming team at UPenn. um, And then two years or two or three years into swimming as a man, uh, decided to transition to female, took a year of uh, hormones, and now is swimming on the female team. And he goes now by the name Leah, Leah Thomas. Leah's been crushing all of her competitors. uh, And until uh, earlier this month, when Leah, Leah lost. Okay, so Leah, who did Leah lose to? Did Leah lose to another woman that he just she happened to swim against in a meet? Not exactly. She swam against a transgender swimmer on the Yale team. But this, so I was asking myself, okay, so let's just say Leah is a woman. She should be swimming against, she, she has been swimming against women. Leah's so, a man. <laughs> I know, no, but I'm saying, I'm right. trying to walk myself yeah. through the genders to try to understand right. what happens. You know what I mean? Right. Okay, so like Leah's in the pool as a, wo- a woman, identified as a woman. Who's she swimming against lately? She's been swimming against biological women. That's why she's been crushing, because she's actually a biological man. Now she loses. Who does she lose that, to? That's correct. Yeah, so now she loses. Who does she lose to? Somebody says, a man, a trans man. I'm like, well, that's a biological woman. So it's the same. That's so right. she's, so she's, but this, this helps Leah's argument in a way because she kind of lost to a biological woman. She did lose to a biological, but now a fellow swimmer on Leah's team comes out and says, that was no accident uh, that she, she told Outkick Sports, uh, that's Clay Travis's organization, that she saw them talking that um, it was right before the 100 freestyle race on January 8th that Leah's time and even the swimmer's observations of Leah that day suggest she wasn't even trying to win. She says these two are friends. She saw them talking. She said, I think there was a deal to let the other swimmer win to prove the point that Leah could be beaten by, quote, 
you know, a woman, and this other woman is biologically women, a woman. I know it gets confusing. I hope you guys are still with me. And here's an example. So the Yale swimmer, who again is a woman who's going to transition to male, got a 49.57 on the 100 freestyle. Thomas lost, Leah Thomas lost to that swimmer at 52.84. So it wasn't close. By swim times, that's um, two full seconds. That's that's not close, or three. Uh, she crushed. During a November meet, Leah Thomas swam that same race at 49.42, which would have beat, which would not only have crushed her own time, but would have beaten the Yale swimmer's time easily. So it does suggest something may have gone on there. And you tell me how this can, this is allowed to happen on the UPenn swim team with no one doing anything about it. Well, it's awfully suspicious. That's a difference of 3.5 seconds, which is massive in the 100 yard. Um, you know, I, I, I've talked to Olympic coaches about this and um, the, the times are roughly same, you know, similar in the 400 meter track events. And there, an Olympic coach just told me that, that you expect to see variations of roughly 0.2 or 0.3 seconds um, meet to meet. Here with Leah Thomas, suddenly we see a, a, a difference of a variation of 3.5 seconds. That's massive. So, look, we're never going to know what happened, but that's awfully suspicious. And and swimmers, look, the, the swimmer who spoke to an uh, outkick, they know when a, a, a swimmer is just keeping pace with the other swimmers. You can tell. And when a swimmer is swimming their hardest. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of credence to that. But, but there's something else, too. You know, the trans man who allegedly beat Leah Thomas... Um, was allowed to continue to swim against the females. I mean, this is someone who identifies as a male, but is swimming against the females. Why? Because there is no logic to any of this. Mm -hmm. It's all about choosing your competitors based on who you can beat and creating chaos. And that's what they're doing. Is the trans male swimmer at Yale, I thought that that person hadn't done anything other than have... A double mastectomy. That's all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about hormones. I thought that um, that person had done nothing to go from female to male other than the removal of the breasts. So she had, you know, that that swimmer has not started testosterone to the best of my knowledge. Um, it, it's, you know, has had a double mastectomy, but not started testosterone. But that person identifies as male. I thought this was about identity. Suddenly, mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. want to swim against women, it's not about identity. It's about something else. Um, it's about current, you know, you know, hormone levels, you know, bioactive hormone levels. Mm, that's a good this point. is ridiculous because, of course, the changes that are brought on by male puberty are enormous. Um, all they're doing is cherry picking the t the competitors they want. And so we're allowing mediocre males to smash women's records. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Because when Leah Thomas was a man, was, was swimming with the men, uh, he was nothing special. Now that he's crossed over to swimming with the women and he's got, you know, a foot in height over them and his, you know, his femurs are longer, his arms are longer. Uh, he's crushing. He's crushing she, Leah Thomas. She is crushing in every race, um, except we Weirdly, that one where, you know, Leah was seen talking to the other trans student, blah, blah, blah. People can form their own conclusions. So explain this to me, Abigail, because even Michael Phelps has come out now saying, uh, look, I believe we should all feel comfortable with who we are in our own skin. But sports need to be played on an even playing field. And that's, I think, him saying this is not fair. He can see it. He knows how hard these women work and how, that they have no chance against a biological male. Um, but nobody's doing anything about it. USA Swimming? Help me understand this they issued a statement in support of transgender athlete inclusion but they didn't commit to any particular rules and i guess now they're kind of saying i don't know what usa swimming is saying ncaa is kicking it um usa swimming seems to be kicking it who's deciding the rules who gets to say no you can't swim against the biological women here at upenn it seems like the Olympic Committee is going to ultimately make a lot of these choices. They're doing it on a case, you know, on a sport by sport basis. But, you know, it's ridiculous because, as you said, the bioactive, however much you bring down your current bioactive testosterone level, it's too late. If you've been through male puberty, you have a much larger heart, you have much larger lungs, you have much more oxygenated blood, you have much more fast twitch, much fun muscle fiber, you have vastly greater muscle mass. Um, you know, this is not a fair c competition and everyone knows that. And I'll just say one more thing, you know, all these people who go on and on about empathy, we need more empathy. 
Well, why don't they try for a moment to put themselves in the shoes of a young woman who has spent her entire life competing and working to be a, a Division I athlete, only to be bested by a mediocre biological male? Try that one on for size. It's completely unjust and everyone knows it. Yes, I could not agree more. It's like, it's just like I was opening the show with talking about the COVID thing, you know, like you get lectured if you try to speak up on behalf of your child saying, I, he lived like this for two years and I don't want him to have to live like this anymore. You know, it's time to shift the balance back in favor of the children. You, they say you want to kill grandma. They call you selfish and blah, blah, blah. It's like, then they demand empathy and they demand that you consider uh, society at large. Great. Let's both do that. Let's both do that. You consider society at large, too, and you include all the children in it, too, and and the sacrifices they have had to make for very little risk to themselves personally, which isn't even medically ethical to ask children to take mandatory vaccines that they don't need to, quote, protect the elderly. Uh, there, a lot of doctors have come on this show and said that same thing here. Right. It's like the empathy only goes in one direction. The good of society, which is what like Glad is, is uh, arguing to, to keep trans swimmers and athletes in the opposite sports uh, sports they, they say it's the, it's about the good of society it's not just these individual swimmers well why why aren't they factored in why don't they get a vote in the good of society the good of society the good of society is successful young women that's the good of society it's complete nonsense to suggest otherwise america has been awfully proud of its young women with good reason and our talented female athletes and now we're letting those records and those achievements be vandalized or completely eliminated um it's it's, it's really an outrage and it's past time we stopped allowing it yeah i'll tell you it'll be it's going to be interesting when and if leah thompson thomas um breaks a record held by Katie Ledecky, you know, one of our most decorated swimmers. And then what? Are we going to allow Leah to say, I am the first female to swim the 100 freestyle at this number? Uh, no, we're not. We're going to have to speak out against it because Leah didn't travel the same roads Katie Ledecky did to get to that number. And, you know, with all due respect, uh, she doesn't get to claim those those wins under that moniker. Uh, look, and think about yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Think about all the little girls who are watching this right now and their parents thinking, should I wake her up at 4 a.m. every morning for swimming? What's the point? What's the point to have a mediocre boy decide his junior year of high school? Actually, I'm a girl. I want to mm -hmm. compete on the girls team. And there you go. He gets to destroy her her scholarship, eliminate all of her you know, potential. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're eliminating a whole generation of, of female potential right now. Now's the time to stop it. Yeah, that's right. And I've said it before. Let, let's see. Let's see what happens in women's professional tennis when you have a, a man say, you know what? I'm, I'm a woman now. I've been through puberty. I've, I'm a full man. I've got all my muscles. I got my biceps. I got it all. And I'm just going to take a little tour on the woman's side. And you see uh, how who wins all the prize money and who gets all the attention and um, whether people will be more vocal on behalf of young women then. Abigail, you're amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on, Megan. So much love. Um, okay, we're going to switch gears now, and we're going to talk to a guy named Johan Hari. He's got a book out called Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression. Now, that book became a celebrated New York Times bestseller, and then he wrote a follow-up. This is the one that's actually out now, and it's called Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. Have you suffered from depression? Do you now find yourself struggling to pay attention? You are not alone. These are really common problems. And some of them have actually been manipulated into you. Okay? Some of them are not entirely your fault. Uh, so we're going to ask Johan about it all. And he's here now. Johan, thank you for being here. Hey, Megan. That was a great intro. Thanks very much. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, so let's talk about focus because... I can see it. Anybody who's gone out to dinner, you look around the restaurant at any given table, half of the tables are on their iPhone while conversations happening with real live humans before their faces, right? You try to talk to a teenager, they're, they're <laughs> constantly looking down at their phone. They, they won't even look at you. You know, the attention span seems to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And how, so I want to know why, and I want to know how is that affecting us? How is the lack of focus affecting us? That was exactly the question I asked myself because I could feel it happening to myself. With every year that passed, it felt like things that required deep focus, like reading a book, 
were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. You know, I could do it, but it was getting harder and harder. So I started to research this. I was quite struck by some of the early research that I saw. For every single child who was diagnosed with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children given that diagnosis. And that's a real problem that they're identifying. A typical American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. So I wanted to understand exactly that question you're asking, Megan, why is this happening to us? So I use my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to travel all over the world, from Miami to Melbourne to Moscow, to interview over 200 of the leading experts on focus and attention. And what I learned is there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or can make it worse. And loads of the factors that are causing our, that can cause your attention to deteriorate have been hugely rising in the last few years. Obviously, invasive tech is one of them. Actually goes way beyond invasive tech, from the food we eat to the sleep we don't get. And this is so important. I mean, I kind of realized it's that our attention didn't collapse. Our attention has been stolen from us by these bigger forces. And the reason, the thing you said that's so important is why is this so why is this so crucial? I would just say to anyone watching or listening. Think about anything you've ever done in your life that you're proud of, whether it's starting a business, being a good parent, uh, learning to play the guitar, whatever the thing you're proud of is, that thing required a lot of sustained focus and attention. And when focus and attention breaks down, your ability to achieve your goals breaks down, your ability to solve your problems breaks down. This is why we become more anxious. In a way, you become a kind of stump of yourself. You can sense what you might have been, but you feel you can't get it, which is why we have to tackle these problems very clearly and face on. Mm. You, you tried it yourself, right? You went to one of the most beautiful places in America, Cape Cod, and tried to unplug and reconnect, grow from the stump to the flowering tree. <laughs> and so talk to us like about a, that. A child, a child in an elementary school play when he said that image. But no, you're totally right. Well, at the start of this journey for my book, Stolen Focus, I thought the problem, I basically had two stories about why I couldn't pay attention. I thought, you're weak, you don't have enough willpower, and someone invented the smartphone. So mm -hmm. I decided to make a really big step of willpower. I went away for three months to Provincetown, which you mentioned, with no phone and no laptop that could get online. I had a, a huge brick phone that couldn't get onto the internet either. And um, I learned a lot, including about the limits of this approach. But the thing that amazed me was how much my attention came back because I was nearly 40. I thought, oh, maybe it's just that my attention, you know, I've gotten older, your mind deteriorates. My attention went back to what it had been when I was 17. It was extraordinary. And I remember at the end of those three months, and there were lots of changes that happened in Provincetown beyond tech that improved my attention that we'll maybe we'll get to. But I remember at the end of it thinking, well, I never want to go back to how I lived before. Why would I go back to that? I remember being reunited with my phone in Boston and within a month, I never went back to quite as bad as I'd been, but I went a long way back. And I only understood why when I went to interview someone called Dr. James Williams, who was a senior Google strategist who became horrified by what Google was doing, quit and has become one of the leading philosophers of attention in the world. And he said to me, the mistake you've made with taking this approach that's purely individual is it's like thinking the solution to air pollution is for you personally to wear a gas mask, right? Mm. I'm not against gas masks. If I lived in Beijing, I would wear one. But this is a huge, exactly like you said at the start, Megan, this is happening to all of us at the moment. It's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all the time. And then that person is leaning forward and saying, hey, buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate. Then you wouldn't scratch so much. <sighs> to which the obvious response is, yeah, I'll learn to meditate, but we need to stop you pouring the itchy powder on us, which is why we need to have two levels of response to this. There are lots of things that we can do as individuals to protect ourselves and particularly our children. The last quarter of the book is about our kids. There's all sorts of steps that everyone can take tomorrow, but I want to level with people. That will help. It's helped me a lot. I can talk about what those steps are. But it will only get you so far because we're living, Professor Joel Nigg, one of the leading experts on children's attention problems in the world, said to me that we need to ask if we're living in what he called an attentional pathogenic environment, an environment that is undermining the ability of all of us to pay attention. And to deal with that, we're going to have to take on these powerful forces that are doing this to us. And I believe we can. And it's not just the iPhone. I mean, I remember this is anecdotal, but when I was at Fox News and working in cable, you'd look down at the screen and there I am delivering a news report or one of my colleagues delivering a news report. And of course, you've got the lower third that adds a new piece of information, you know, to, 
in addition to what the anchor is telling you. And then beneath that, you have the ticker that has got all, yeah. you know, the NASDAQ and the stocks. And so people can understand whether their money's going up or down in the stock market. And then on screen left, you'd have additional facts about this guest or this topic, right? So it's like, and then people at home could watch all that and do picture in picture. So they've got the NFL game sitting there in the bottom corner and they probably have their phone out as well. And then you go to break and you'd give the audience a task, like go to foxnews.com and enter, you know, ask, answer our poll, right? Like, how many things can we layer on ourselves at one time? You're so right, Megan. You've gone to one of the key 12 factors that I write about. And it was a moment this really fell into place for me. I went to interview Professor Earl Miller, who's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. He's at MIT. And he said to me, look, you've got to understand one thing about the human brain more than anything else. You can only think about one or two things consciously at a time. That's it, right? This is just a fundamental limitation of the human brain. Human brain has not changed in 40,000 years. It ain't going to change on any time scale. Any of us are going to see, mm. you can only think about one or two things at a time. But what's happened is we've fallen for a massive delusion. The average teenager now believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. Oh, so when right. scientists get people into labs and they get them to think they're doing more than one thing at a time, they observe them. And what they discover is you can't do more than one thing at a time. What you do is you very rapidly juggle between the things you're doing. And it turns out that comes with a huge cost. The technical term for this is the switch cost effect. When you try to do more than one thing at a time, exactly what you're describing, you're trying to watch Fox News, you're also trying to watch the game, you're also trying to, what does that person just say to me on Facebook? What was the WhatsApp message there? Wait, who's at my door? What you're doing is when you try to multitask, you will do everything you're trying to do much less well. You make more mistakes, you remember less of what you do, you're less creative, you're just significantly more incompetent. And there's one study, there's loads of evidence for this, but it's one very small study that really drove it home for me. Hewlett Packard, the printer company, did a little experiment, they got a scientist in, and he split their workers into two. And one group was told, just do whatever your task is, get on with it, you're not going to be interrupted. And the second group was told, do whatever your task is, but you've got to answer a fairly heavy amount of email and phone calls. So basically the life most of us live. And then mm -hmm. at the end of it, they gave them all an IQ test. The group that had not been interrupted did 10 IQ points better on average on that test than the one that hadn't. To give you a sense of how big that is, if you smoke cannabis, in the short term, it lowers your IQ by five points. So that evidence shows you'd be better off sitting at your desk, getting stoned and doing one thing at a time <laughs> than you would what we do at the moment, which is being constantly distracted, you know, not no getting stoned. And uh, no, oh, to be clear, you're better off <laughs> neither getting stoned nor multitasking. But the, Professor Miller put it to me, we are living in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation. And, and there's just one more study about this that really threw me. A guy called Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon discovered if you're interrupted, and it can be something as small as a text message, it will take you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus you had before. But most of us are never getting 23 minutes spare. So we're constantly operating at this profoundly diminished level of attention and focus. Mm. And so the, the, so the question is, how do we stop doing that? How do we save ourselves? Because if even you went to Provincetown and came back and got sucked back in, I mean, it makes me feel better because, you know, most people don't have three months to go spend at, at the beach and, you know, so they have to stay in this world permanently. And then you came back. The, the, we have to ask ourselves about solutions as opposed to just unplugging because that, that's not exactly. realistic. Um, exactly. so that's a good tease. That's as good a You're tease as any to, to leave it right there. Squeeze in a break. Come back with answers. And I want to get to the depression thing, too, because I think a lot of people are dealing with that right now. Uh, Johan, don't go away. So, Johan, what are the solutions? I mean, you mentioned one thing you mentioned that I'd, I'd love to get to is sleep. Yeah. So for all of the 12 factors that are screwing up our ability to focus and pay attention, we've got to handle it at two levels. I would put it as we've got to play defense and we've got to play offense. So there's all sorts of steps that everyone listening can take tomorrow, today, to defend themselves and their children. So I'll give you just one example that helps a little bit with sleep. Sleep is a huge factor. I'm sure we'll get to that. So you, you can't see, I'm pointing stupidly, but you can't see behind my laptop, obviously. I have in the corner of my room something called a K-safe. So it's a plastic safe. You take off the lid. You put your phone in, you put the lid on, you turn the dial at the top and it will lock your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day. On my laptop, I have a program called Freedom that does the same thing. I will not sit down to watch a movie with my partner. I will not sit down to have a meal with my friends unless we all put our phones in the K-safe. Mm. And it's hard at first. It, it massively helps me with sleep, by the way, because you lie there with your phone next to you, you're sort of half awake, you feel anxious, you check it. If you just lock it away, 
you've just got to go to sleep. You just lie there. You've got nothing else to do. Um, so the the it's really difficult at first, but as the muscles of focus start to come back, as you find yourself, the rewards of focus start to kick in, being able to think deeply, being able to solve problems, it really works. So that's the deep, that's one of dozens of examples that I give in the book of things we can do to play defense. And there's loads of things we've got to do with our kids on that front. We've got to model good behavior for our kids as well. But then we've got to go on offense because the truth is this is being done to us by really powerful forces from the food industry to the people releasing pollution in the air that's inflaming our brains. But let's look at one that a lot of people think about, which is tech. So there's an analogy that really helped me to think about what we need to do with tech now. We're about the same age, Megan, so I think you'll probably remember. It used to be really normal. I remember my mom used to put leaded gasoline in her car, right? And it used to be normal, this is before our time, for people to paint their homes with leaded paint. And then it was discovered that the lead in paint and in petrol, when children's brains are exposed to it, it really damages their ability to focus and pay attention. So when this was discovered, a group of ordinary moms banded together and just said, you know what, you're not going to do this to our kids. You're not going to damage their ability to think. We need to ban leaded paint and leaded petrol. Now, it's important to say what they didn't say. They didn't say, let's ban all gasoline. They didn't say, let's ban all paint. They wanted to go after the specific aspect that harms our attention. And there's an analogy. I spent loads of time in Silicon Valley interviewing some of the leading dissidents who designed this world that we live in and have been kind of hijacked by their own creations and feel really bad about what they've done. And, and that analogy really helped me to think about it because we don't want to ban social media. We're not going to all convert and join the Amish, nor would we want to. No disrespect to the Amish. I was going to say in case they're listening, <laughs> but I guess they're not. They're not listening because they don't, don't have think this so. technology. But I don't think the Amish demographic is huge. But... <laughs> We're not going to go and join them, right? What we want is the good things about these technologies as much as we can have them without these bad things. And this is why you have to understand the specific aspect of the technologies we use that is invading our attention. And it comes down to the business model, which at the moment is very simple. Every time you or your kid pick up your phone, these social media companies start to make money. And the longer you scroll, the more money they make. So all of their algorithms, all of their engineering power, all of this genius is geared towards one thing. How do we get Megan to pick up her phone more often? How do we get her to scroll more often? How do we get her kids to do the same thing? That's it. That's all they care about. It doesn't matter, matter whether the companies are run by nice people or nasty people. All they care about is will you do that? But social media doesn't have to work that way. At the moment, as Sean Parker, one of the biggest initial investors in Facebook, explained, we designed it to maximally invade people's attention. We knew what we were doing and we did it anyway. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. That's what he said. We now know, of course, from Facebook's, which you cover very well, Facebook's leaked information that they know they're doing it, right? So Asa Raskin, who designed a key part of how the internet works, said to me, look, the first step of the solution is really simple. You've got to ban the current business model, just like we banned lead in paint. You've got to say, a model premised upon figuring out the weaknesses in your attention in order to hack them and sell them to advertisers. That's just inhuman. It damages our brains. It damages our societies. We won't allow it. And when people started saying to this to me, I said to them, it seems so odd. I said to them, but wait, so let's imagine we do this. We ban the current business model. If I open Facebook the next day, would it just say, sorry, guys, we've gone fishing? And they said, of course mm -hmm. not. What would happen is they'd have to move to a different business model. And everyone listening has, has experience of the two alternative business models. One is subscription. We all know how HBO and Netflix work. Or another is think about the sewage system. Before we had sewers, we had you know, feces in the street. We got cholera. So we all pay to build and maintain the sewers. And we all own the sewers together. Now, it might be that like we own the sewage, sewage pipes together. We want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the equivalent of cholera for our attention. But the key thing to understand is... Mm. Whatever the alternative model we move to, suddenly all the incentives for the social media companies are different. The incentive isn't, how do I hack Megan and her kid's attention in order to invade it as much as possible? It becomes, what does Megan want? Oh, Megan wants to be able to pay attention. Okay, let's design it to heal her attention. Oh, Megan wants to be able to meet up with her friends offline. Let's design a way to do that. But if we don't change the incentives, and the only way that will change is if we pressure them, just like the lead industry was never going to go, hey, guys, we've made enough money. Let's stop putting lead in paint. We've got to, it, this will only happen if we force these companies to do it. How? They have shown, I mean, they're so powerful and they're so rich and they're bigger than government now. It's almost like it's too late. That's how, that's how it feels. You know, yeah, there were times when I felt like that. And when I felt like that, Megan, I, I would, and it's not sound strange, 
I've thought a lot about my grandmothers. I was raised by one of my grandmothers because my mother was ill when I was a child. My grandmothers were the age I am now in 1963. One of them was a working class Scottish woman living in a housing project. And the other was a Swiss woman living on the side of a mountain in a wooden hut. And in 1963, my grandmothers were not allowed to have bank accounts in their own names because they were married. It was legal for their husbands to rape them, as it was legal everywhere in the world for men to rape their wives. In practice, it was legal for their husbands to beat them up because the police never did anything. My Swiss grandmother wasn't even allowed to vote. And I think about how, how much power was ranged against them. Right. And then I think about my niece, who's 17, Erin, who I absolutely love, you know, and I think about her life and how unimaginable it would be for someone to say she shouldn't be allowed to have a bank account. You know, it should be legal to rape her. I mean, no one would say that. They'd be regarded as a psychopath if they said that. And so when people say to me, as you just did, and I totally get it, I feel it myself. Oh, my God, these forces. And it's not just big tech. Many of the other factors invading our attention that write about in Stolen Focus. These are really powerful forces. I remind myself. They're not, they're not a tenth as powerful as men were in 1963. Mm. Men controlled literally everything in the world in 1963, every country, every company, every police force, every army. And they had since all those things were invented. And it's tempting to get in, tempting to say, and I used to say what you just said, Megan, that think about it, these companies are more powerful than governments. But when you look at the evidence, that's not true. Look at what happened in Australia. The Australian government, a, a centre-right, a conservative government in Australia, decided to take on Facebook because... Facebook has destroyed the, our industry, the news industry, right? The the um, you used to get advertising in newspapers. Now it's all gone, almost all gone to Facebook. So the Australian government said to Facebook, "You're going to have to start paying the media companies. You benefit from having their news stories on your site. You're going to have to start paying them percentage." And Facebook huffed and puffed. They threatened to shut down in Australia. And what happened? They gave in. Because mm. ultimately, governments are much more powerful, and we can, and our governments will be as good as we can make them. So I would argue, just like we needed a, a movement for women to reclaim their their lives, that's what we've got made change the story from my grandmother's life to my niece's life. I think we need to have an attention movement to reclaim our minds, and it requires a real shift in con conscious, uh, consciousness. I think, Megan, we've got to stop. There's lots of things we've got to do at an individual level, and I talk about a lot of them in the book. But also, we need to stop asking just for these small things. We are not like medieval peasants sitting at the court of King Zuckerberg begging for a mm -hmm. few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we don't have to tolerate our children being hacked and invaded and our own minds being hacked and invaded to the point where the uh, one small study found that a typical college student now focuses on any one task for only 65 seconds. Another study found that college students can't focus for more than a few minutes and the average office worker only focuses for three minutes. This is no way to live. We don't have to live like this. Most humans have not lived like this. We can deal with the factors in our food supply in the way we work, in the technology we use. We can deal with these factors that are doing this to us. But at the moment, it's like a race. All these factors doing this to us, they're getting stronger and stronger. Paul Graham, one of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley, said the world is on course to be more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last. Think about mm -hmm. how much more addictive TikTok is to your child than Facebook was, right? So they're going to invade us more if we don't act. So what we've got to have on the other side of this race is loads of us saying, no, you don't get to do this to us. This is not a good life. We don't tolerate it. We're going to regulate you. You can still have your business. You'll still be very rich people. We want you to have good lives, but you don't get to invade us to the degree that you're doing. I think people are just becoming aware of it. You know, I think it's just becoming frontal lobe well, as people realize, wait a minute, I don't feel very good. I'm on the phone all the mm. time and I just don't feel very good. And then you see it happen in your kid and you really have to pay attention. But the, the business model, you know, thanks to the social dilemma, and I know that you, you've uh, talked a lot with Tristan Harris. He was on the show just last week in a very uh, eye-opening mm. and disturbing mm. episode, uh, which everyone should 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 listen to i've ever since we did it i'm like what can i do with this i got to go to all my schools and tell them that we need to have him come lecture or i, I can just summarize or something but like mm. everyone needs to be it's a red alarm it's a five five star red alarm fire um i don't know i just i i i think people are it's just becoming uh, they're becoming aware of how they've been you're manipulated. Totally right. i think I think you're totally right about both things, both that Tristan Harris is one of the great heroes of our time and everyone should listen to him. And also, you're right that I think at the moment, most people are where I was when I started writing the Stolen Focus four years ago, Megan, which is I'm just thinking, well, this is a problem with me, right? I'm just mm -hmm. not strong enough. I remember I had a real, <laughs> such, had a real uh, weird moment when I started researching the book. 
because I thought I had a problem with my willpower, right? So mm. I went to interview this guy called Professor Roy Baumeister, who's the leading expert on willpower in the world. He wrote a book called Willpower, right? Oh. So I go to interview him and I said, oh, you know, I'm thinking of writing a book about attention. I'm just thinking about it. And he said, oh, it's, it's interesting you should say that because I've noticed I can't really pay attention very much anymore. I just play video games on my phone <laughs> all the time. And I was sitting there, I was like, wait, didn't you write a book called willpower I'm like, oh my god if this guy can't pay attention so you have some real moment i was like oh wow is this happening to literally everyone right but we have no I think it's also you mentioned your kids schools and i think there's it's interesting because if we think about the 12 factors one of the things that fascinated me is when i started partly i thought it was a willpower problem and mainly i thought it was a tech problem one of the things that was so interesting to me is actually doing the research tech is not the biggest cause. So if you think about things you can talk to your kids' schools about, I'd recommend, for example, one of the other 12 causes, which is the way we eat. So there's this really fascinating new movement called nutritional psychiatry. You should have some of these guys on your show because I think you'd really find them fascinating. Mm-hmm. She's looking at the, the ways, how the ways in which we eat affects our mental health and our mental abilities. And what these nutritional psychiatrists and others taught me is the way we eat at the moment, and I- I've literally got a McDonald's bag in the corner of the room, so I'm not saying any superiority. Uh, the way we eat at the moment is really damaging our ability to focus and pay attention in three big ways. So one way, so imagine you eat a typical American or British breakfast. You have, you know, a sugary cereal, you have white bread, the stuff I grew up having, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what that does is it releases a huge amount of energy really quickly into your brain, right? Release a huge amount of glucose. So it feels great. You're like, I've woken up, right? You suddenly feel like you're awake again. Um, But what happens is an hour or two later, you'll be at your desk or your kid will be at their school desk and you get a real energy crash and you get what's called brain fog. We just can't focus until you get another carb, another sugary treat. And what's happened is we live, the diets we eat make us live on a kind of roller coaster of energy spikes and energy crashes throughout the day. So we're experiencing periods of brain fog where if we ate food that releases food steadily, which most people of humans, most humans in history have eaten, you can pay attention much more easily. The way one nutritionist put it to me is it's like we're putting rocket fuel into a mini, those little 1970s British mm-hmm. cars. It'll go really fast and then it'll just stop. There's two other ways. The, what, the diet we eat deprives us of the nutrients that we need for our brains to develop fully. Um, and also, our, it's not just that our diet lacks the things we need. It actually contains chemicals that act on us like drugs. There was a really chilling study in Britain where they got 297 kids and they split them into two groups. And one group was just given water to drink. And the other was given a drink that contained a lot of the food dyes that contain in the candies that mm-hmm. your kids eat pretty often, the stuff we get in supermarkets. And the kids who drank the food dyes were significantly more likely to become hyperactive, manic. So We've got to change our food supply system. If your school is full of vending machines, if it's full of, and there's been a big move to this as we cut back on funding for school meals, you know, vending machines containing cookies and other sugary carbohydrates, that's going to trash your kids' attention. Mm. So there's, there's, there's all sorts of these other factors, which are, some of which are even bigger than tech, that we've got to look at. Wow, my God, this is fascinating and, and something we can do something about, like ASAP, mm. our diets. The yeah. I'm wondering as I'm listening to all this, whether this is, it's no surprise that you wrote a book on depression. Now you're writing a book on focus, but they they do seem linked, right? You, all these things, you can't focus, you can't have sort of the joy that comes with long moments of downtime and being able to focus and let your mind wander and become more creative. Um, I'm sure it's it, it can be connected to feeling depressed, but I want to ask you about the depression too, because um, that's fascinating to me. I think a lot of people are dealing with it right now. Uh, Lost Connections was the name of that book, released in 2018, New York Times bestseller, The Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. And the, the, one of the quotes on, on the book is um, it, from Melton John. If you've ever been down or felt lost, this amazing book will change your life. Do yourself a favor and read it now. So great. I'm going to try and persuade Elton to sing a duet with you about the book. That's uh, pretty cool. You got Elton John. <laughs> um, all right. So can we talk about that for one minute? Because what what is it? Because you kind of ruled out that um, it's not just like you were put on antidepressants when you went to your doctor and said, I don't, I don't feel so good. And he's like, oh, I can increase your serotonin. It's going to be awesome. And then you went through the same cycle that so many people go through, which is the depression came back and then you increased the drug and this cycle until you you beat the, the drug, <laughs> sadly, and it no longer is of use to you. And then then what do you do? And you're at you're forced to ask the question of, I guess I'm going to have to deal with root causes. You know, that's a really good way of putting it. And I think one way that helps us to think about it in relation to what we've been through in the last two years is 
everyone knows they have natural physical needs. Obviously, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And the culture we built is good at many things. I'm glad to be alive today. But we've been getting less and less good <clears throat> at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for a very long time now. And it's funny, you mentioned chemical antidepressants. There was a moment this really fell into place for me. Um, so I took chemical antidepressants. They helped me for a while. Then the effect wore off, sadly. They give some people real relief. And anyone who's listening, who's getting real relief from them, my advice is to continue taking them. But there was a, a moment I went to interview this guy called Dr. Derek Summerfield. And he happened to be in Cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants for people in Cambodia. They'd never had them in that country before. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, were like, oh, what's an antidepressant? And he explained. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And he was like, what do you mean? He thought they were going to talk about some kind of herbal remedy like Ginkgo biloba, St. John's wort, something like that. Mm. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine and he got his leg blown off. So they gave him an artificial leg. And a few months later, he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's really painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb. And I'm guessing it's pretty traumatic to go back and work in the field where you got blown up. The guy started to cry a lot. After a while, he just refused to get out of bed. He developed what we would call classic depression. This is when the Cambodian doctors said to Dr. Summerfield, well, that's when we gave him an antidepressant. And he said, well, what was it? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense. He only had to talk to the guy for five minutes to see why he was so depressed. One of the doctors figured if we bought this guy a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position that was screwing him up so much. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. It never came back. They said to Dr. Summerfield, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? Now, mm. if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that it's entirely a biological problem in your brain, that sounds like a weird joke. I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. She gave me a cow. But mm. what those Cambodian, Cambodian doctors knew intuitively from this anecdotal example is what the leading medical body in the world, the World Health Organization, has been trying to tell us for years. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, there can certainly be biological contributions. But in the main, you are not a machine with broken parts. You're a human being with unmet needs. And what we need to do is help you to get those deeper needs met. So I'll say I went to lots of places in the world that have built their responses to depression primarily around that. Does that ring true to you, Megan? Yeah, my gosh, mm. that's amazing. And you, and that too, we're losing at every turn, right? We're not, we're not prioritizing one another or relationships. We look at the phone. As I said, back to my example at the dinner, you have live humans yeah. there who want to be with you. They want to hear from you and talk to you, tell you about their experiences and hear about yours. And instead you're online scrolling with people who are not there. And sometimes who you don't even know and and who definitely don't care about you it's like it's yeah. all it's all been turned on its head and i i dream of one day i realize we're not going to be the amish but you know that we sort <laughs> of get back to more of our luddite roots and there's a movement you know that's real and that that you can really draft into that rejects this technology where we can go back to living with some of its advantages. You know, I'm not going to lie. I love the convenience of Amazon, sure. but, but rejects some of this social media stuff that can be so corruptive of actual relationships. I want to say one other thing before I let you go. So we talked sure. about um, your book, Stolen Focus. That's what's out right now. We talked about just a bit on Lost Connections, the book on depression. We didn't talk about the book released in 2015 called Chasing the Scream, The Opposite of Addiction is Connection. And I just want to give it a shout out because our audience should know not one, but I think two movies are being made based on this now. A story <clears throat> about Billie Holiday, uh, which is by Lee Daniels, and then um, another one narrated by Samuel L. Jackson called The Fix. So you're crushing it, Johan, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled for you. And I'd love to have you back to talk about more of these. I would absolutely love that, Megan. It was very weird have, hearing Samuel L. Jackson read out my lines. I, I considered asking to record my answer phone message in character as this character from Pulp Fiction, but oh. I thought it'd be a little bit disrespectful, so I couldn't quite no. myself to do it. But it's You're like crazy, a you gotta do that. Room. It's, it's not like too a late. It's where you wake up and Samuel L. Jackson is saying your words back to you. It's like, what? What's, what's happening? 
yeah. I insist Thank you so that much, you do that. If it next, be, before you come back, you don't come back without telling me you've done it. Samuel Jackson <laughs> has got to read that to you. All right. Great to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Cheers, Megan. Thank you. The name of the latest book is Stolen Focus. And I hope you listen tomorrow because we're having one of our great debates. This one's going to be on guns. Guns in America tomorrow. Download The Megan Kelly Show on podcast for free and YouTube.com slash Megan Kelly. See you tomorrow.